Um, all right, well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I don't think I properly introduced myself, but I am Kat. I'm coming in live from Brooklyn, New York, and I work with Wild Alaskan Company as part of the recipe team. Um, and I just thought it would be really cool and maybe informative and fun to share with you how I go about cooking and enjoying um, my box of whackfish every month. Um, I know that the webinar was titled How I Added More Seafood to My Diet, but honestly, it's more um, about how I enjoy more seafood in my everyday life um, because I didn't always eat this much seafood and definitely not always seafood from Alaska. But um, the short answer to how I added more seafood to my diet is I started working for the company. Um, I have to cook fish every day, almost every day. Um, I'm always trying out different recipes and species and techniques and flavors. So um, I usually end up eating seafood probably two or three times a week, which is great. That's sort of what, you know, the doctors tell you to do. Um, but there are a few things that I found that make it really easy for me to enjoy seafood as an everyday part of my lifestyle. And that's what I want to share with you today in this event. So the event is broken up into three different parts. Number one is super, super basic. Um, it's just a little miniature thawing demo um, that hopefully encourages you to eat seafood anytime, even if you're planning ahead or not planning ahead, um, because it really is something that you can have any, any day of the week. Um, part two, I want to share some of my favorite cooking essentials um, that make cooking any species really easy and really delicious. Um, you know, everyone has is going to have their own favorite tools, but these are the things that have really helped me become a better cook and just has made it my life so much easier. Um, part three is a cooking demo of one of my favorite cooking techniques. Some of you probably are familiar with it um, and may or may not have tried it, tried it with your fish, but we'll get to that at the end. If you have any questions along the way, you can go ahead and ask it in the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen, not the chat, but in the Q&A. Um, that'll just make it easier for the moderators to pick it out from uh, the noise of the chat. Um, I'll pause for questions a few times throughout the event. Um, and if I don't get to all of the questions today, or if you just happen to completely stump me and the rest of my team, then we'll follow up with more answers in an email. Um, my colleagues from the member experience team will be dropping helpful links into the chat throughout the event. Um, they're just sort of in the background here. Um, so keep an eye out for links from them as well. Here's Meg waving hello, Kristen. I don't know if Eileen will be popping up on camera, but she's here. Um, and again, if you have any questions along the way, Oh, there's Eileen. Just go ahead and send this through the Q&A, not the chat, um, but if you drop it in the chat, we'll find it there too. So um, before I move on to anything, I just want to share a little bit of love for seafood from Wild Alaskan Company. Um, I'm not exaggerating when I say it's some of the best fish on the planet for so many reasons. Um, for one thing, it's wild caught, it's sustainably harvested, so those are two qualities that set up apart from some of the seafood that I personally used to shop for. Um, and beyond those things, the quality is just like fish that I've actually eaten in Alaska. Um, I went last year for the first time, and I, it was something that I'd heard from a lot of our members that it reminded them of a halibut fishing trip they went on or when they went salmon fishing in Alaska. So I can vouch for that now that I've been to Alaska. It's just like the fish there. So curious if you've been to Alaska, um, feel free to drop that in the chat, or I think we'll have a little poll if you've been there or not. Yep, there's the poll. I'm going to say yes and click on that on my screen. So to move on to part one of this, um, I'm going to be thawing a piece of Pacific cod, which I have right here. Um, if, if frozen fish is new to you, thawing fish might be a new part of your routine. Um, it certainly was for me when I first started getting uh, fish from Wild Alaskan Company. Um, I used to buy Alaskan fish from a store in my neighborhood, but that was way before I knew, knew what I was missing out on with the fish that you get in every box of Wild Alaskan. Um, what I didn't know that I know now is that this is some of the freshest fish you can find. Um, it's frozen at the peak of freshness, basically right off the boat. And as soon as salmon or halibut or Pacific cod is pulled from the water, the clock sort of starts ticking on the freshness. So the more time the fish spends unfrozen, the less fresh it becomes. Um, so that's why this stuff is so great and so much like the fish that you're getting in Alaska if you're ever traveling there. 
Um, flash freezing is a really very effective way to preserve freshness. Like I said, it essentially stops the clock on anything that happens after the fish has been harvested. Um, so just to take a really quick tangent, generally, if you see any Alaskan fish displayed at your neighborhood fish counter, whether it's a local fishmonger or a bigger grocery store, it's pretty much always fish that's been previously frozen. That's something that I didn't know. Um, fresh is sort of a marketing myth um, due to the seasonality of many species of fish from Alaska. Um, you can re read more about that. We'll drop a link in the chat here in a minute. Um, but salmon season, for instance, there are some species that you can only fish for it for like six to eight weeks in the summer. So in order to preserve that fish to sustain um, a community year round, it has to be preserved. Fresh and freezing it is one way to do that. Um, so when you see you store fish at the grocery store that's thawed, you actually don't know how long it's been sitting there or if it's been moved back and forth from the freezer a few times, that's not a good thing. Um, but with the seafood from Alaska, frozen at the peak of freshness, you're thawing it whenever you're ready to cook so that you know it's super, super, super fresh. Um, so that's what I'm gonna show you how to do right now. Um, I just, have, I love my kitchen chairs, so I cut this open, take it out of the pack, no matter how I'm thawing it. And I'm gonna have to grab a plate here in a minute, but the conventional way to thaw fish is to basically leave it in the refrigerator overnight. Let me just turn my back really quickly to grab a plate. Um, what you will do is plop that fish right on a plate just like that and then you put it in the fridge that's all there is to it I'm not going to actually put it in there because that's not how i'm going to thought right now but um you leave it in the fridge for 10 12 hours so a little longer than overnight i'm sure um most of you sleep for less than 10 to 12 hours every night um and usually by the morning it's fully thawed or almost fully thawed so um whenever you do it that way you can keep it in the refrigerator for another two days at most. Um, try to cook it as soon as it's ready to go for like peak peak freshness. Um, but then it's ready for you whenever you're ready to cook it. Um, it doesn't smell. That's one thing that's really nice about this fish is it's so fresh that you're not going to have like a fishy smell emanating. So just on a plate, you don't have to cover it. That's all you got to do. Um, how I'm going to thought today is the way that I pretty much always saw my fish because I don't plan ahead or I can't always plan ahead. Um, but I usually have at least an hour's notice for cooking something. So what you're going to do is you're going to take it out of the pack and then just grab a resealable bag. This has been through many lifetimes, this particular bag. Stick it in here. Make sure that the seal is nice and tight um, and push out any excess air. But um, then just going to make sure you can see what I'm doing here because I have a big bowl of cool water. It doesn't actually have to be big. I'm just doing this so you can see it. And you just drop the fish in, weigh it down with a plate or whatever you have nearby. Maybe you have a um, pepper grinder or coffee mug, whatever it is. Um, and then you leave that on the counter um, within maybe 30 minutes to an hour, depending on the thickness of the filet, uh, your fish will be thawed and ready to cook. When you cook it this way, um, because you're thawing it at room temperature, just for food safety purposes, you have to cook it right then and there. Um, you can't wait two days to cook it. So that's the only con in my opinion about this. Um, ideally you wanna thaw it overnight because it preserves the best quality and texture and you have control. But this is like the real realistic way to do it in my life right now anyway. So um, the only thing that you wanna do is every 30 minutes change out the water so that it's not too warm. Uh, it's a little warm here in New York today. So um, changing out the water in, in 30 minutes will ensure that it's not getting to a really hot room temperature. Um, and yeah, just keep doing that for about an hour. This is a really chunky piece of cod. So my guess is that'll be ready in about an hour to cook. So I'll just have that for dinner later, I suppose. Um, so if you don't have time to thaw something for dinner, um, what you can do with salmon specifically is cook it from frozen. Um, we have two methods that I've tested out for, to bake salmon from frozen or to pan fry salmon from frozen. Um, and it's a really convenient way to have dinner, lunch, breakfast, straight from the freezer to your plate in 30 minutes or less. If you're pan searing it, it's like 15 minutes. Um, 
the it's something that I definitely do from time to time. You absolutely sacrifice some control over the doneness of the fish, um, especially if you're cooking a thicker fillet because the frozen center or the center stays frozen longer than the outside. Anyway, it's all in our cooking guide that we have on the blog. So um, highly recommend you checking that out for the times when you just are hungry. You have an unexpected guest and you just happen to be cooking salmon. Those are the ways to go. Um, my favorite way to cook it from frozen is pan searing because you actually can get crispy skin. I know that seems kind of crazy, but um, definitely try it. Um, I haven't tried it with white fish yet. So um, if don't try it with white fish, it might end up super, super dry. Um, any questions before I move on to the next section? Yeah, we have a question. Um, this one's from Sharon. So she put her salmon in a 400 degree oven got a little distracted. Um, we've all been there and boom, her fish is dry and overcooked. Um, so can you, do you have a couple of tips on how to use um, a piece of fish that maybe you overcooked and got a little bit dry? Absolutely. Um, so that happens to the best of us. It happens to me. Um, I really like, one of the things that I really like using overcooked fish for is fish cakes. Um, so we have a few different recipes on the blog for different kinds of fish cakes. Um, but essentially what you're gonna be doing is flaking or chopping any fish into a mixture of like mayo, eggs, some spices, some vegetables. So that brings more moisture back into the final dish. Um, it's really easy to make. Um, I actually make this a lot after um, I work on any photo shoots for some of the, the, the like food shoots that we have. Um, to produce these like beautiful pictures on the blog because I'll just have so much fish. And yeah, it's a great thing to just have in the fridge or you can even stash it in the freezer. But it's one of my go-to ways to like save dried out fish because I never want to throw it away. It's perfect in fish cakes. Um, you could also flake it into something like a chowder and then it doesn't really, you won't even notice that it's overcooked. So try the fish cakes for sure. That, that's my favorite. Um, any other questions right now before I move on? All right, let's move on. So part two are my essentials. Um, cooking any species of fish, even if you're not really familiar with the particular species that you have in front of you can be as basic as cooking any other protein. Um, and I know that might feel a little strange to say because we think a fish is this really precious, delicate thing. Um, but honestly, it's just as easy to cook fish as anything else I've cooked um, in my life. So um, I do have some essential tools that I find make it easier for myself. Um, most importantly, uh, I just want to give a little shout out to Wild Alaskan Company's How to Cooking Guides. We have cook times, cook temperatures, and techniques for every species that you're getting in, you know, your first or second box um, for a lot of the major cooking methods that we would recommend using it for. Um, so they're really, really helpful. I think um, those are like my number one thing. If you do anything, just use one of those cooking guides and you'll get to know the fish better. Um, wild, wild salmon, for example, cooks faster, much faster than farm salmon because it's much leaner. Um, the way that farm salmon is produced causes it to have an unnaturally high fat content so when you're using a recipe that you used to cook farmed salmon with, it's gonna overcook your wild salmon. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I highly recommend just looking at the cook times and temperatures that we have in our cooking guides. And then from there, you can you know, use any recipe you like and just adjust it as you needed based on what our recommendations are. Um, so that's the same thing for Pacific cod versus Atlantic cod. They cook a little differently. They're slightly different in textures. Um, anyway, do that first. Moving on to some of the fun things, sort of like the toys that I have in my kitchen. Um, I'll say that I didn't always cook this much seafood. So I didn't have the opportunity to build upon my skills and know what made me feel really comfortable in the kitchen. But Number one thing other than the cooking guides is this fish spatula. I actually had this in my kitchen for a long time and didn't know that it was a fish spatula. I just thought it was a funny looking, cool, fancy French thing. I don't know why I thought it was French, but apparently that's what I thought something fancy like this was from. So um, these actually come in lefty and righty uh, tapers and it really helps you get under the fish. 
it's super flexible. So anytime you're pantsering something, you don't have to worry about jamming it under the fillet. It'll kind of just go with the shape of the pan and the shape of the fish. Um, it's also really nice that it has these um, like wide spaces. If you're ever, you know, shallow frying something in a little bit of oil, it kind of drains out when you're lifting up a piece of fish and putting it on a plate. So I recommend getting one of these. It just makes flipping a whole lot easier, whether you're using this indoors or even outdoors on the grill. Um, I know the handle's a little short, but um, like I said, it's one of the best uh, ways to flip anything without losing it to, you know, broken fish sadness. Um, number two, I have an instant read thermometer, um, just like a little pointy end here. This is better than, actually the only thing you wanna use um, when you're measuring the temperature of fish. It needs to be instant read because fish cook so quickly. You wanna have a really um, accurate instant read on the temperature. If you're using like your grandma's old turkey meat thermometer, your reading is gonna be way off. By the time it comes to temperature, the fish is gonna be overcooked. So this is not an essential essential, um, but I feel like it's a really helpful when you're not used to cooking fish you don't really know what level of doneness you like. Um, and you're not sure if you've cooked it too long or too little. Like, what does it mean that fish is done when it's flaky with a fork? Well, you can use that as a test or you can double check with an instant read thermometer. So um, we do have uh, our recommendations for medium rare to medium doneness um, on our blog, but if you want something well done, then you, know, you can just kind of go from there. Um, so I don't use this so much anymore because I kind of know how I like my fish done. Um, and I sort of know what to look like. And like I said, I've almost internalized a lot of the temperatures and cook times for my how-to guides. So um, it is a really helpful tool when you're starting out though. I also use it to measure the temperature of oil. So if you're ever frying anything with batter, um, it's like a nice thing to make sure the batter is nice and golden. But moving on to my next tool. Um, this sounds really basic, but I have lots and lots of kitchen towels or paper towels in the kitchen. And aside from just the obvious, like it helps you clean up messes, um, as a tool for cooking fish, this is like instant next level because anytime you're padding, anytime you're cooking fish in a pan, baking it, broiling it, you wanna make sure that you pat the fish dry. Um, getting a lot of the excess moisture off the surface of the fish will help you get a really beautiful sear, a really beautiful broil. Um, whenever there's moisture on the surface of fish, it actually steams. Um, so having something to pat it dry, whether it's a clean kitchen towel or paper towel, that's like absolutely essential. Um, and yeah, don't skip that step. I didn't even know that was a step until I started like working for this company, but like I said, instant like level up for any of your fish, fish cooking skills. Um, Next thing is the member experience team. They're a great resource for any food questions that you have, um, whether you're looking for recipe inspiration, um, not sure which species goes with what flavors. Uh, if you're having problems like overcooked fish, what do you do with it? Um, feel free to just contact them on the Wild Alaskan homepage and ask them any question, whether it's about your order or about what you're doing in the kitchen. They love talking about food. They like if you have any cool fish facts or pictures of when you've been to Alaska, like we're just happy to talk about fish no matter what, and really genuinely here to help you um, cook better fish because we want you to have really good food. So um, moving on to some of my essential ingredients. I have a lot of essential ingredients that I work with, um, but I just want to give a little shout out to three of them. Um, I really like, I don't have them in front of me, but I really like panko breadcrumbs. They're basically a coarser type of breadcrumb. They cook up really crispy. I use them in fish cakes because they're a great binder. Um, it's also a really nice topping if you're ever baking fish. The, like the cod that I'm defrosting now, after we're done and after the cod is uh, thawed, I'm gonna make this like quick and easy baked cod that has this golden, panko crust. It's super easy to make. So panko is something that if I have it in my pantry, I know that I'm going to be able to make something really delicious with my fish, no matter which species it is and whether I'm frying it in a pan or baking it. So highly recommend trying panko breadcrumbs if you haven't before. Um, another thing I really like, I mean, it's not like a very special jar of pesto, but I love 
having pesto in the fridge um, is something that lasts or that can last for a while. Um, and it's a really nice topping if you're ever baking any species of seafood. It's great to toss into a pasta. It's basically just instant flavor and you don't really have to make a sauce. You just put some pesto on there and then call it a meal. Um, that's a lot, that's like a go-to of mine for sure. Um, and I love it, especially in the summer when I am making fresh pesto, but even just a nice store-bought jar of pesto is um, a good thing, I think, to keep in the fridge. Um, and then another thing is miso paste. It comes in a, several different containers. It can be in like a squeeze tube or um, something that's not see-through, but um, I won't go too much into my love affair with miso paste, but it really adds a nice savory flavor to fish. Um, I think it pairs really nicely with the delicate flavor of everything from halibut or to the stronger flavor of something like sockeye. So um, you'll see, actually, there are a lot of miso-based recipes on the Wild Alaskan Company blog. Um, it basically lasts forever in the fridge. Um, I think this is probably like two years old. So um, it's something that you know, if you want to try it out, I highly recommend it. Um, it's pretty much a game changer for uh, for me now that I have started cooking with it a lot more with seafood. So those are some of my pantry favorites. Um, and lest I forget, the final tool that I want to share with you is something that you probably all have, parchment paper. Um, so parchment paper has obvious benefits like easy cleanup, but um, for me, it's my secret weapon for really, really easy meals because I can use this to cook in papillote. Cooking in papillote basically just is a French word for that means that you're cooking in parchment packets or in a pouch. Um, so you can actually do this with foil. Foil does a lot of the same things. Um, and foil does have the benefit of you can put it on the grill or put it under the broiler, but parchment just looks really, really beautiful um, when you're cooking with it this way. Um, and uh, if you've never cooked with it before, basically what it does when you're making, um, I'll show you this in a minute, but when you make a, par a parchment packet um, and putting fish inside, you're able to steam fish to perfection. Um, it infuses the fish with whatever flavors you have in the packet. And plus it's just fun to open up a present on the table. That's kind of what it feels like every time. Um, so you, if you're having four guests over, you can make four little packets and everyone has their little individual um, fish present in front of them to enjoy for dinner. So um, before I show you how to make a parchment packet, any questions? Yeah, we have some great questions. So um, Jill made fish tacos actually tonight with a piece of cod, <clears throat> but any thoughts on which of the Wild Alaskan Company fish makes best tacos and any favorite taco recipe? Well, honestly, you can't really go wrong with, this is like such a not answer, but I like making tacos with all of the seafood that we have. Um, cod is a really nice one. Um, I like, especially with cod, I like doing some sort of breading. There's one recipe that we have that's like a coconut crusted cod taco. That's super nice. Um, we also have rockfish is really good for tacos as well. I worked on one a couple months ago that you just cook in an air fryer. Um, and yeah, and then I've made halibut tacos. Any any seafood is good for tacos, honestly. I probably make it more with whitefish um, than salmon, but um, there is you probably, you're not getting this in your monthly box, but occasionally we have a special for ground sockeye. Um, it's basically like, yeah, it's ground sockeye, ground salmon. And I love making that into Tex-Mex tacos. It tastes almost like the American taco I grew up eating. So um, yeah, any species. Sorry, that's not a definitive answer, but it's the truth. All right, let's do one more question. Um... Yeah, any fish taco is a good fish taco for me as well. I also want to shout out that we have a poll about miso. I'm really curious um, who's heard of miso and who's used it. Um, but uh, Mark is asking, why do you use cloth towels instead of paper towels? Can you use paper towels to pat your fish dry? Definitely can use paper towels. Um, I don't use paper towels because I would go through so many of them with all of the work I do. 
I have a huge stack of clean kitchen towels and I have a washer and dryer in my apartment. Um, I know my husband was a little tentative with this idea of me using cloth towels to pat the fish dry, but, um, and he always swears, he's like, this one, you definitely use fish on. And like, it's just in his head because I always end up just rinsing it off after letting it dry out and then throwing it in the hamper. And it's um, honestly been a really good way for me to just cut down the waste that I have in my apartment. Um, because like I said, I go through so many. So whatever you feel comfortable using, it's a very polarizing thing for me to do to say that I use cloth towels, but it's again, the truth, it's what I do. Um, all right, let us move on. Maybe next time we can do a poll on if it's if people approve or disapprove of me using clean kitchen towels. Um, so what I'm gonna do is before I talk too much about um, what I'm doing with uh, fish and tapioca, um, I just wanna get it started so that I can get it into the oven. Um, so I have some fish thawed already in my fridge, just a piece of salmon and look at me patting it dry with my towel. So I'm just gonna set this aside um, and let me turn my camera down so you can see what I'm doing here. So I just have a piece that's big enough to um, fit the fish. Uh, it doesn't have to be perfect as long as you're, you have some space to work with. So just gonna set the fish down here. Uh, sorry, the lighting in here is getting blocked by my screen, but um, I'm gonna do something super simple. I have some lemon sliced up. Let me just make a little, bed for my salmon. I'm just treating it like a person right now. Squeeze a little bit of lemon juice over. Um, I have some salt to season it up. Um, and it, as you noticed, I, I, I left the skin on the fish. This will just help keep it moist um, as it cooks. Uh, with other species like cod or halibut, um, it's, there is no skin on it, so you don't have to even think about that. Um, I just have some olives that I want to use up. So I'm throwing that in here and a couple sprigs of parsley. So it looks nice and pretty. Um, since this is pretty lean, I always, always like to add some olive oil or butter, some sort of fat. Um, and then this is the fun part that probably takes a little bit of practice. When you're making the packet, you're basically going to be making um, like a like it's gonna look like an empanada at the end or like a calzone maybe, um, but you're making little pleats around the edges and sealing it as tightly as you can. It doesn't have to be hermetically sealed, but sealing it as tightly as you can so that when it's cooking, the steam stays trapped in the pouch. So let me just do that and hopefully I do it really nicely since this is live, but um, can't really see what I'm pleating. But. All right, so that's pretty good. It, like I said, looks like a little happy empanada. Um, I'm gonna put this on a baking sheet like this, just in case there's any leakage. Um, and then I have an oven preheated right now. I think I have it preheated to 425, but um, there's no perfect temperature. You just, you just wanna have a hot oven. We have a few recipes on the blog if um, you don't wanna guess, and you shouldn't guess, but um, I'm gonna put this in the oven. If, fish that's this, the that filet that's this thin, probably maybe 10 minutes is my guess. So that's where I'm gonna put it now. And maybe by the time we're done, you can see what I just made. So um, going back to why I love this method of cooking, um, it's not impossible to undercook or overcook fish when you're cooking in papillote, um, but it cooks the fish a lot more gently. Oh, let me set my timer for first before I overcook my fish and end up having to make uh, fish cakes with this. Uh, let's do 10 minutes. Um, okay, so like I said, it's not impossible to overcook it or undercook it, um, but because it's steaming even at a high temperature, uh, the, the fish cooks more gently. Um, it's really great for any level of home cook, whether you're just really new new to it, haven't cooked anything in your whack box yet, or you're like a super fancy chef who likes to put beautiful, beautiful things in these packets and probably can do a much better job at folding it than I can. Um, 
I really like it because there's so many possibilities in terms of flavors and ingredients, um, you know, over the course of the year, it doesn't have to be lemon, parsley, and olive oil. Um, you know, you can also uh, switch it up completely, do something like Dijon mustard, a little bit of cream, some fresh dill and sliced onions, or coconut milk, just like a couple of tablespoons of that, some curry powder, uh, aromatics like ginger and garlic, and maybe some zucchini. Uh, anything that has a lot of fragrant flavor, um, and, and even something like a vegetable that'll cook quickly, uh, like something like asparagus, zucchini, green beans, um, those you can put into the packet um, and have everything cooked together in just this one tidy pouch. Um, so, you know, we do have recipes, like I said, but you can also, once you get used to um, the timing for the fish, just try try things, be, like be creative, see what you have in your fridge. Um, you know, like if you have some olives from forever ago, like I did, just throw those in there and see what happens. Um, the only things that aren't really gonna cook so well in a packet are uh, really, really hearty vegetables, like butternut squash is gonna take forever. It's not never gonna take 10 minutes in an oven. So um, yeah, tender vegetables, things that are like sliced really thin, a little bit of like herbs, liquid, and then you pretty much have a meal any night of the week. Um, you can also, uh, I did just put that right into the oven, but if you make a packet, you can put it in the fridge and have it like prepped and ready for later. So, you know, if you have time over your lunch break, um, if you have a lunch break, then you can have your dinner ready so that it's something that you don't even have to think about when you're done with, um, you know, whatever you're doing during the day. So, um, that's something fun to try. I always like putting it right in the oven because I just want to have my little like seafood gift for myself. Um, so what I was cooking right now was sockeye, but I really like cooking coho salmon in papillote because it's a little bit more delicate in flavor um, compared to sockeye. Sockeye I tend to save for really um, hearty preparations, pan searing, grilling, broiling, um, but honestly, they're interchangeable. Do what you like use whatever species you like, kind of like my response to making tacos. You can steam any fish you like in papillote and it's gonna be really good. Um, the only one I actually haven't tried it with is rockfish because I like doing really like bold stuff with it. It's um, not a mild white fish, it's got robust flavor. So um, I'd save that for something a little less delicate, but um, yeah, any questions before uh, we get to uh, see the big reveal? Actually, I still have like, six minutes left on the fish. So let's chat. All right. We're open for questions. Um, a couple people asking what temperature is the oven? Just remind us. Um, right now I'm using 425 uh, for this. I know that on the blog, it's it's like a total range of temperatures. Uh, some recipes say 375 when you're cooking in papillote. I think one is as high as 450. Um, the temperature isn't super, super important for this because it's a little bit um, shielded from the heat of the oven. So um, yeah, anything like 400, 425, just uh, it, it should work. No matter what temperature you're using, it'll work. Awesome, and what herbs did you use? For this, I had parsley, so that's what I put in there. Um, but uh, herbs like basil, um, especially like when I'm doing something with coconut milk, I love having Thai basil or mint um, or cilantro to throw into the packet um, because of the steam, like all of those aromas really, really uh, come out um, as it, as it bakes. Um, so that's like any, this is like a really good thing. If you love herbs, like just put it into the packet. Um, yeah. But right now I just had parsley. So that's what I used. So right now you're baking in papillot, but Mark is asking, are there any cooking time and temperature adjustments for the air fryer instead of the regular oven? Um, so with the air fryer, I, I don't have a good answer for you in terms of saying like, oh, always cut off two minutes or always cut off three minutes off like a regular bake time. Um, but we do have a handful of air fryer recipes on the blog. Um, I'm just trying to think off the top of my head when I am cooking a filet of um, of salmon in an air fryer, it usually cooks quicker than what um, I'm cooking in the oven. Um, so 
I would say if you're adapting any recipe on your own for an air fryer, uh, it's better to check it, like be be like super conservative, um, check it earlier than you think you need to, um, because you can't ever give your fish, <laughs> you can't like make your fish less done. You can always leave it in for a few more minutes. So err on the side of like maybe cutting off 25% of the cook time. That's totally uh, probably imprecise math, but yeah, be conservative. I love cooking fish in an air fryer, by the way. I didn't know I was going to love an air fryer. Um, I live in Brooklyn, so I have a lot of stuff here already in my small apartment. But, um, you know, the, the last thing I wanted to add was a giant appliance. But um, honestly, it's really fun to cook with it. Um, we, I think, just recently published a really awesome fish and chips recipe in an air fryer um, where you're coating uh, Pacific cod and crushed potato chips. So that's one that I made like three days in a row when I got the recipe from a chef who developed it for us. Um, yeah, just uh, search air fryer on the blog and you'll be able to see um, a few recipes come up. And if you have any, like I would love uh, for you to share it with the member experience team um, and, uh, you know, we can try it out. I'm going to drop, drop that fish and chips recipe in the chat for everyone. Um, that's a great one. Um, another question about the NPAPI oat. So do you test the temperature by poking through the parchment, I, I guess, with your instant read thermometer, or would you open up the package and test it? It's a good question, Jack. You know, it's funny. I was thinking about this the other day, and I've never tested it with the thermometer. Um, I've always opened up the packet. I don't know why, because this thing, this uh, thermometer is very pointy. So it's a really, um, I'm going to try that tonight, actually, because uh, usually I just open up the packet. And if it's not done, I, I sort of seal it back up and throw it back into the oven. Um, it's completely fine to open up a packet when you're cooking in papillote. Um, since most of the steaming is already happening, like you're never going to be able to get it perfectly sealed again. If you're using foil, it's a little bit easier to get um, the packet resealed for obvious reasons because it crimps. Um, but, you know, if you're leaving it in there for another two minutes or so and it's not completely sealed, it's fine. But yeah, today I'll try the, the, the stab through the parchment method and I'm very curious if that's going to work. It will work, I'm pretty sure. So um, any other questions? I have a couple more minutes before the uh, big reveal. Yeah, a couple. So is there a reason not to thaw the fish while it's still in the plastic casing? So there is a food safety argument for this that I won't necessarily go into today, but the reason that I recommend it beyond that is um, when it's in that vacuum sealed package, even if the seal is a little broken, um, as it's thawing, there is an ice glaze around the fish that starts to melt off. Um, when it's in the refrigerator or in a bigger like resealable bag, like I have in my like bowl of water over here to the side, um, that ice glaze doesn't get trapped against the surface of the fish uh, or it has a little more space to sort of move around. It just makes it a little easier to pat the fish dry. It makes it a little less waterlogged when you're moving it to uh, a separate bag. I know it seems like an extra step, but um, it's something that it I, I found it makes a big difference in the quality of the fish um, when you're ready to cook it, whether you're quick thawing it um, on the counter or thawing it in the fridge. Um, it makes a big difference, especially when you're thawing it in the fridge to take it out of the packet um, so that there's some airflow, some of the ice glaze evaporates, um, you know, because the fish isn't uh, covered by anything. So um, like I said, then it's not trapped against the uh, surface of the fish. Thank you. Um, we had another question about in Paviot or just cooking with coconut milk in general. Um, do we have any recommendations for cooking fish with coconut milk? Um, I mean, I really, I, I love coconut milk for something like a stew. Um, I think it's a really nice way to add uh, richness to a dish. I'm not anti heavy cream by any means. Like I, I definitely love having heavy cream um, in something like a chowder, but um, with coconut milk, uh, we have a few recipes on the blog that I think do a really, really nice job um, 
using coconut milk as the base for some sort of rich stew. Um, it just is a really nice um, flavor profile in something like when you're cooking and papio, you just need like a dash of it, like in a dash, I mean, like a quarter cup of it for a filet and it ends up becoming this really, really nice sauce. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that really answers your question, but um, I guess my answer is, it's just a really nice thing to use. I always have cans of coconut milk in my pantry. I didn't say that was one of my essentials, but it pretty much is. So, um, okay, I am gonna check on the fish right now. And if you'll bear with me. All right, so what you can see is the parchment paper. I don't know if you can really see the color, but um, it was white before and now it's got a little bit of browning around the edges. So that just means that it's about ready to um, check. So I'm gonna use this method of going into the parchment like this. So right now, this is pretty much done. I think it's a little bit, yeah, actually it's 120. Um, and I like 120 for uh, salmon because, or for wild salmon, because it's so lean. Um, I like a nice medium rare filet. So um, let me just show you the big reveal here. Still have my kitchen shears out. I love using them for anything. Um, the steam is pretty hot when you're opening it. So just be careful. All right, this is probably not as visible as I hoped it would be, but my fish looks perfect. And if you could smell what this smells like over Zoom, you would be really, really hungry right now. Um, let me just push, put this on a plate so maybe it's a little bit easier to see. All right, let's do this. Take my little lemon raft, put it on a plate. So there is my filet of salmon. I'm just gonna move this parsley aside. It was mostly there for the flavor and aroma, um, but the fish looks perfectly cooked. And for the moment of truth, I'm gonna flake into it. Um, it flakes super easily with a fork. Nice, juicy pieces of salmon. That's good. So I hope you are inspired to try this method, if not tonight, sometime this weekend. And, um, you know, whether you're using lemon and olive oil like I did, or trying something like coconut milk, um, like I suggested, it's going to be delicious. So um, that takes me to the end of this event. Uh, thank you so much for joining um, me and the rest of the team. If you have any questions whatsoever, please reach out to us. Um, today or afterward. Um, and like I said, if you are looking for recipe inspiration or just want to nerd out about fish, um, don't hesitate to write us. Um, overall, I hope you have fun in the kitchen, make some epic meals along the way, and as always, live wild. <laughs>